In this video, we're going to take a look at a marine slow speed engine exhaust gas valve. That's quite a mouthful, but basically it means we're going to take a look at an exhaust gas valve that's used on large ship engines. This particular valve that we're looking at now, it might be several meters in height, that's six foot or more. It might also weigh over a ton. It depends on how large the engine is. This type of valve is used for very large engines, the type of engines that you'll find on large ships. In this video, we're going to have a look at all of the parts. So we'll look at the air spring. I'll tell you what that is and how it works. We'll look at actuating pistons. We'll look at the valve guide, stem, rotator, disc, and many other parts. And then I'll explain to you exactly how this valve works. Let's take a look now at where the valve will be installed. So here's a large container ship. It might be about 300 meters in length, about 30 meters wide. That's what we call Pan Max. That's the biggest type of ship that can go through the Panama Canal. You can see that the engine is over here. We've got six exhaust gas valves. You can see them pointing up at the top. These are little Christmas tree type items. And if we take a look at the engine in a bit more detail, you'll see exactly where the valves are mounted. So here's the same engine. You can see them right at the top installed on top of the engine cylinders. If we take a cross section, you can see that we've got our usual components inside the engine, such as a piston, cross head, and then down the bottom here, this area here is our crankshaft. And if we want to see the engine in operation, we can. There are more cylinders in this engine, and that's why we classify it as a six cylinder engine. We're not here to talk about the engine though, because we've got a separate video for that. Let's focus on the exhaust gas valve. So there's a simplified version of the exhaust gas valve at the top here. It's just got one big piston. But if we focus on the valve disc, that's this item where my mouse is. When we press the play button, you can see that it opens and closes to let exhaust gases out of the combustion space. Notice also that the valve rotates. That's quite interesting. We're going to have a look at that a bit later on. When we discharge exhaust gases from the combustion space, we do this via the process called scavenging. So fresh air is drawn in here through these ports and fresh air flows upwards and forces the exhaust gases out of the combustion space. The exhaust gases flow through here and flow here around the valve disc and around the stem and then they'll enter an exhaust gas manifold over on the left side of the screen here. This type of scavenging arrangement is called a uniflow scavenging arrangement. I'll explain to you what that is in a minute, but let's just follow the animation through for a moment. I just want to show you what happens as the piston moves up. The piston moves up and we cover up those fresh air inlet ports. And you can see that the exhaust gas valve, if it's not already in the closed position, it is very quickly. And that's because the piston's coming upwards. We inject fuel. We get our controlled explosion. The piston moves down. And then as soon as we uncover those ports again, Fresh air flows in, it's at a greater pressure than our exhaust gases, and that's why the air flows in, the exhaust gases are pushed out, and we scavenge the combustion space, replacing that exhaust gas with fresh air. I mentioned uniflow. With this model here, you can see we've got cross flow, uniflow, and loop flow. These are different scavenging types. Uniflow, we bring fresh air into the bottom, it flows upwards, and we force exhaust gas out at the top. With cross flow, we bring fresh air in at the side here through this port, comes up around and the exhaust gases flow out of the side. And the other type of flow that we got is loop flow. That's where fresh air comes in at the bottom, flows up here, cross to the side, and then forces the exhaust gases out of another port just above where the fresh air comes in. The shape of the piston will change, or the top of the piston, what they call the piston crown, depending upon what type of scavenging mode we're using. This is the exhaust gas valve. It's mounted to the top of the engine using hydraulic nuts. We're going to hydraulically tighten the exhaust gas valve onto the top of the engine. The reason being, if we manually tighten the nuts, we wouldn't be able to get enough force to hold the valve on the engine. The pressures in the combustion chamber are simply too high. The valve will be blown off the top as soon as we had our control explosion, if not before. So we hydraulically tighten this valve onto the top of the engine. Let's have a look at some of the components. We've got the valve disc. That's this lower piece here. 
We've got the valve stem, which is a long, thin cylinder that runs upwards through the valve. Around the valve stem, we've got a valve guide. That's this thin item here and on the other side. That runs all the way around the stem and that holds the stem in position within the valve housing or the valve body. The valve body is this steel structure all around here that I'm showing with my mouse and around here. It has many internal passages, not just to allow the stem through, but also to allow cooling water to flow through the valve. As an example, in here, this is a cooling water space and that cooling water space comes all the way around to here as well. The entire thing is full of cooling water that allows us to extract the heat from the exhaust gas valve. With the valve stem guide, we need to seal the space between the exhaust gases. Exhaust gases flow in through these gaps here around the disc, in between the disc and the seat. The seat is where the disc seats, that's around here. And the exhaust gases flow inwards. They occupy the entire space, all of this area where I'm moving my mouse and they flow into the exhaust gas manifold. In order to seal the space though, between the stem and what's called the air springs, that's up here. This is an air piston where I'm moving my mouse and this space here below the air piston and between the valve body is the air spring. In order to stop the exhaust gases coming up between the guide and the stem and into the air spring area, we use lubricating oil. This lubricating oil flows between the valve stem and the valve guide, and it forms a seal stopping the exhaust gases from exiting where they're supposed to be in the exhaust gas passage and stops them coming into the air spring area. This is similar to how piston rings work within a combustion chamber. If you haven't seen our marine two-stroke diesel engine video, then check that out. I'll explain to you how that works. Coming further up, here we can see the air piston or the air spring piston. It's mounted directly onto the valve stem. We have an actuating piston. And then further above that, we have a lifting eye. The lifting eye is used to lift the exhaust gas valve off the engine and also to put it into position. We'll use an overhead crane for this. There'll be one in the engine room. Sometimes you might use a chain block as well, just to pull it into position. That's just for fine maneuvering the valve. Whereas the overhead crane is really for lifting it and taking it away from the engine for maintenance or installing it. The parts that we've looked at, such as the valve disc, the valve seat, let's have a look at that again, valve disc, valve seat, where the disc seats over there or where it sits when we want our seal. Those parts are common terminology parts that you'll use with all types of valve. A ball valve has a ball disc. A gate valve has a gate disc. A butterfly valve has a butterfly disc. Valve stem, also you'll use that terminology when you look at any type of valve, stem guide or valve guide, valve body, all of those are terms that are used for different types of valve as well. So just keep that in mind. That's not just for this type of valve, that's for all types of valve. Now let's have a quick look at the rotator. The rotator spins every time the valve opens. Back it up again. You can see that there. What's going to happen is the valve opens, exhaust gases rush out of the combustion space. They pass over this rotator. That's why it has these strange shaped fins. The kinetic energy from the exhaust gases as it's passing over the rotator causes the rotator to impart a force on the valve stem. This force is rotary. It's a torque. This makes the valve stem rotate along with the valve disc. And the reason that we do this, as you can see here, is because we want even wear on our valve disc and also on our valve seat. We don't want any deposits building up, as an example, in this area here and only this area. So every time the valve opens, we spin it a little bit. And that means that any deposits that are on the valve disc or the seat will be spread over a wider area rather than accumulating on one specific area. And the reason we do this is because any deposits that form on the valve disc we don't want them forming to such a degree that the valve disc and the seat will no longer seal together. If we rotate the disc, then we get even wear across the disc and the seat. And also we stop deposits accumulating in one specific area. Not only that, but the thermal stresses that are applied on the disc and the seat and also on the lower part of the valve body will be more distributed because we're not getting, as an example, exhaust gases flowing through just the right side of the valve because the other areas are blocked off with deposits. 
Or if they're not blocked off, perhaps we've got deposits there accumulating. And that means that more flow is going to come from this side. More heat is going to be transferred to this side of the valve. And then we're going to get an uneven thermal distribution across the valve parts. So we don't want that. And that's another reason why we want the valve disc to rotate. And we use the rotator to do this. Quite an ingenious design, really, because we're just using the energy from the exhaust gases in order to eliminate all of those problems that I just talked about. We use a hydraulic system to open the valve. Don't worry about that for the moment. I'm going to show you how that works. But what I want to talk about before we switch to a diagram is the air spring. The air spring occupies this area where my mouse is and this area as well. We're going to feed compressed air via a non-return valve into that area at about seven bar pressure, which is about hundred PSI into this area. And what happens is as the hydraulic pressure reduces, remember we've used hydraulic pressure to open the valve. As that reduces, because we drain it off, the air spring pressure overcomes the hydraulic pressure and that forces the valve back into the closed position. So essentially this is a hydraulic open pneumatic close valve. Let's now take a look at the diagram because I want to explain to you exactly how the hydraulic system works. So here's a basic cross section of our exhaust gas valve. At the top, we've got hydraulic oil coming in. The hydraulic oil is used to actuate a piston. It forces the piston down when the pressure increases and that's what opens our valve. Also on the left, we've got compressed air in. This is used to close the valve. The air flows in via a non-return valve so that the air cannot blow back out again when the pressure increases. So we're charging the space underneath our air piston. As soon as the hydraulic pressure reduces, the air spring pressure overrides the hydraulic pressure and that closes our valve. You can see also on the diagram quite well where the cooling water passages are. Let's take a look at a more detailed diagram. With this diagram here, we're going to focus on the hydraulic oil system. Down here, we've got a can in the lower left corner. It has a irregular shape. The reason we have that irregular shape is because as the cam rotates, we want to push up this pump follower. That's this black circular ring. When the pump follower is pushed upwards by the cam, we're going to compress the oil in the hydraulic oil circuit, causing its pressure to increase. That then causes the operating piston to be forced down, which opens our valve. As the cam continues its rotation, the follower is going to be pressed back down again onto the cam. That's going to cause a pressure reduction in the hydraulic oil system to such a degree that the air spring pressure exceeds the hydraulic oil system pressure and the air piston is forced upwards. The air piston is attached to the stem. So we're going to force the stem and the valve disc upwards. The disc is going to be pressed against the valve seat. We get our seal and the valve is now closed. Note on this diagram that we've got a interesting drain that's coming from our air spring. That drain is allowing some of the oil from the air spring to drain into the space between the valve guide and the valve stem. That allows us to form a seal to stop the exhaust gases flowing out into the air spring. That's the seal we spoke about earlier. That was a brief introduction to this exhaust gas valve. It's quite an interesting type of valve, I think. In some ways it's simplistic, but if you dig down deep, it's actually quite complicated. It's a marvel of engineering. And people don't even realize or appreciate it because it's only one of the parts of an engine that's used to push maybe a 50 or 100,000 ton ship through the water, sometimes an even bigger ship than that. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to follow me on LinkedIn if you'd like to be notified whenever we have a Sabri Snacks video release. And also don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. Thanks for your time.